13, the famous or notorious Antichrist chapter. I'll begin in verse 11, however. And I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. Notice he tries to look like a nice person. One key of the Antichrist is he tries to look Christ-like. This guy is going to be good. More about that in a moment. He exercises all the authority of the first beast. This second beast is the false prophet. They are both co-equally antichrist. The same as you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is a satanic counterfeit. The antichrist, what we would call him, the first beast, the false prophet, and Satan. It is just a counterfeit of the triunity of the Godhead of the Bible. Notice one is a religious figure, one is a political figure. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in the presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. Again, a satanic counterfeit of the resurrection of Jesus. He tries to look like Christ. He performs great signs so that even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. He deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast whose wound of the sword had been healed and had come to life. And there was given to him breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast might even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all the small, the great, the rich, the poor, the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on the right hand and on the forehead. We know the way technology is going as we speak. And he provides that no one should be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the number of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let he who has understanding count the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Some manuscripts have a varied value, but the predominant one is 666, which I'm quite convinced is the correct one. Let us understand certain things. This guy is going to counterfeit Jesus. He is going to try to look like Christ, like a savior, like a Messiah figure. What most people fail to take into account, they're looking at 666. That's not the first thing it tells us. There are two ways the Antichrist is going to seek to deceive people, even people who say they're Christians. Now, we have to understand something. We are told... You have these two beasts. But secondly, we are told, there are many antichrists. The Greek word antichrist actually means in place of, not simply against. When a pope says he's infallible, he's attributing or ascribing to himself a divine property when he speaks ex cathedra, putting himself in the place of Christ. Well, who is the one who is infallible who acts in the place of Christ? It is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the true vicar of Christ. He acts vicariously in behalf of Christ. He communicates Christ to us. He inspires us to understand the Scripture. He interprets the Scripture for us. The papacy is one institution that is in place of the Holy Spirit. One is your teacher who's in heaven. No, it's when the Pope speaks the cathedra and he can't make a mistake. He can proclaim munificentissimus deus. Mary had no sin. Well, that happened. Pope actually proclaimed Mary had no sin. Now, the scriptures say all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. That's why God had to become a man. In the Magnificat, Mary herself said, Mary herself said, when angel Gabriel, Gabriel, the mighty one of God, announces to her, she's going to be the mother of the Messiah who will save his people from their sin. First words out of her mouth. My spirit magnifies the Lord My soul rejoices in God, my Savior. First words out of the mouth, your baby's going to be the Savior. I need one. (laughs) Now understand, blessed are you among women. Mary is the greatest woman who ever lived. (laughs) God himself became physically incarnate inside of Mary. She gave birth to the Savior, the Messiah. This is the greatest woman who ever lived. And the greatest woman who ever lived said, I need a Savior. None born among women is greater than John. And John said, I'm not worthy to tie the boot lace of Christ. Fix the thong of his sandal. All have sinned except Jesus. Well, if the greatest woman who ever lived says she needs a savior, and if 
the Word of God says she needs a Savior, I personally believe her. I believe Mary. You have a choice. You can either believe Mary or you can believe the Pope. Well, I believe Mary. You can believe Mary or you can believe the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. I believe the Word of God. This is the greatest woman who ever lived. Uh, I hope he speaks ex cathedra. He's infallible. You understand what's happening? Jesus is the Word. So you're putting something in place of the Word, the Word of man. God is infallible. No, you're putting a human into a position of claimed, feigned infallibility. Now, again, I'm not against Catholic people. I'm simply stating facts. These are actual facts. Well, that's only one example. There are many antichrists. If you were to take the papal title, for instance, which is uh, the Catius Christus in Latin, and translate it into Greek, it is antichristus. When every pope puts on the tiara, he says, I am antichrist. Now, I'm not saying the pope is the antichrist. There are many antichrists. There are antichrists in the New Testament. There are antichrists in the Old Testament. All the other antichrists, both in biblical history and in church history, foreshadow and teach something about these ultimate two beasts. Most Christians have no idea about this. But we should and we need to. Let's understand this further. There's these two beasts, but there are many antichrists. But then there's something else. Look with me, please, to 1 John. 1 John, chapter 4, verse 3. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the antichrist. The same as the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church. The Spirit and the bride say, come. The same as the Holy Spirit is preparing the bride, the faithful church, for the return of Christ. The Spirit of Antichrist is preparing the apostate church and the world for the coming of the Antichrist. As we speak, two spirits are at work in the world. One is the Holy Spirit preparing for the coming of Christ. The other is the Spirit of Antichrist preparing for the coming of the Antichrist. We see this in two spheres. The spheres of politics and economics and the sphere of religion. One beast is in each. Again, I keep my political views separate from my Christian views. But when you see people looking for a political messiah, that's the spirit of Antichrist. That's the spirit of Antichrist. When you see somebody who will claim to be a Christian preacher and he will call Jesus in Arabic by the Muslim name, Isa, which according to the Koran, God has no son and he's not the son of God, instead of by the name Yeshua HaMasiah, which Arab born-again believers use, who is the son of God, they have a different Jesus. Same as the Mormons. The Mormons have a different Jesus. Their Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan. That plastic dude on the dashboard is a different Jesus. <laughs> the biblical Jesus said, if anybody says I've returned physically other than the way I left, he's going to come back the way he left to the Mount of Olives. Anybody says he's come back again, get away from them. Don't believe it. Don't go there, Jesus said. Yet today, all over the world, millions of Roman Catholic masses were said, and they believed that Jesus physically returned under the appearances of bread and wine today. That's Christ incarnate to them, the blessed sacrament. They worship it and pray to it in an act of idolatry. Then they eat it ritually in an act of cannibalism. In Acts chapter 15, the apostles condemned the ritual consumption of blood. If it's transubstantiated and it's really his blood, why are you playing Dracula and drinking it? If the apostles said, don't. Well, Again, I'm not trying to offend Catholics. I'm stating the facts. That's what they believe. They believe that's him physically returned. But he said, if anybody says I've come back physically, get away from them. It's a different Christ. The Roman Catholic Jesus is not ours, at least not the Eucharistic one. The plastic dude on the dashboard is not ours. The Mormon one is not ours. And either is the Esau of Islam, in whose name Rick Warren prayed at Obama's inauguration. The world is being set up for it. Well, what is this? It is the spirit of Antichrist. Many will come in my name, or they'll call themselves Jesus, but it's not our Jesus. Two people named Robert Jones in the telephone directory in Riverside. Does that mean they're the same Robert Jones? <laughs> of course not. 
especially when one tries to look like the other. But let's understand this. Identification of the Antichrist is a massive subject, longer than we have time to. I'm simply touching on what the pastors of this church assigned me to do and the time I have allotted. The first thing he will try to do, and the way he is setting up the apostate church now, first thing we're told before 666 is this. He is going to put on a show in Revelation chapter 13. Signs and wonders. Nesim vaniflaot. Counterfeit signs and wonders. The counterfeit does not mean they're not supernatural. It does not mean they're not in some way miraculous. That they don't occur contrary to the laws of natural science. The counterfeit does not necessarily mean leger de main. The counterfeit means the spiritual power on back of it. Look what we're told again in Revelation chapter 13. He performs great signs. Revelation 13, 13. Well, we're told more about the nature of these signs and how he's going to do it. Turn with me, please, to St. Paul's explanation and prophecy of the Antichrist in 2 Timothy, if you will be so kind. 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul's eschatology. Verse 1, in the last days, difficult times will come. He's speaking in an eschatological or last days context. But in verse 8, he says, just as Jonas and John Braze oppose Moses, so these men oppose the truth, men of depraved mind. Who were Jonas and John Braze? Pharaoh's magicians. What did they do? Mimic, copy the miracles of Moses and Aaron. Were the events supernatural? Yes, they did things by demonic power. The way that Pharaoh's magicians counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron is a picture, a type of the way the Antichrist and false prophet are going to mimic the miracles of Jesus and his witnesses. Signs and wonders. Understand it's a spirit. Now, Jesus had miracles, but he never had a miracle crusade. Jesus had healings, but he never had a healing crusade. Except where there was a reason to comply with the requirements of Torah, go show the high priest because it was leprosy. When Jesus healed people, it was, that's between us. Keep that to yourself. It's all right. That's not the point. Healed that paralytic, sin no more. That's the point. Did he have miracles? Yes. Did he have healings? Yes. And unlike most of the nonsense you see today, they could be medically authenticated. They involve neurological necrosis. Blind people seeing, deaf people hearing, dead nervous tissue that won't regenerate. Neurons won't regenerate. The Jews believe, we know from the Talmudic literature, that only the Messiah could make a blind person see and a deaf person hear. Yeshua did these kinds of miracles. They could be verified. Today, most people cannot verify the miracles. It's been proven and shown on television in this country, on national TV, concerning Todd Bentley, Benny Hinn, and others, that they're frauds. Having said that, Jesus did the miracles and the healings. But it was always these signs follow. Never a miracle crusade, never a healing crusade, always a repentance crusade. He never allowed signs, wonders, miracles, healings, what Jews call Nesim Veniflaot. That was never the focus of his message or ministry, and it's not the focus of his message or ministry today. It is the focus of the message and ministry of the spirit of Antichrist, not the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. Now, I'm a Pentecostal myself. By definition, I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. Cessationism is a false doctrine. Jesus can and does do miracles today. Tongues exist today. Prophecies exist today. Most of what we see may not be genuine, but what's in the Scripture certainly is. You see people flocking to arenas and stadiums for this. (sighs) They're going to see a show. This is a wicked and an adulterous generation seeking a sign. It is not the Holy Spirit. It is the spirit of Antichrist setting up an apostate church for the biggest con in human history as we speak. That's the first thing he's going to do. Signs and wonders that are really not of God. 
That's assuming they're even real. Let's look, please, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul's other major eschatological treatise. Speaks of the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. Anthropon a nomon. I can't tell you how many times in the last 10 to 12 years I've tried to show people things. Look, that's not biblical, that's not biblical, that's not biblical. And their standard response was the same. You're a Pharisee. Well, in fact, Pharisees were people who taught as precepts of God the inventions of men. The fact that they're believing things that are not biblical proves that they are the Pharisees. They're just too ignorant to know it. People who teach as precepts of God the inventions of men are the true Pharisees. They're just too ignorant to know it. What they are is actually a nomon, lawless. Lawless. The fruit of the Spirit is a crete, self-control. You see people going to Toronto, Canada, and Pensacola, Florida, doing these crazy, outrageous things. They're out of control. It's not the fruit of the Spirit. fruit of the Spirit is a crete. They're lawless. So we're told about this apostasy that's going to come because of lawlessness. Jesus says, because of lawlessness, most men's love will grow cold. They always yell, you're a legalist, you're under the law, without even knowing what they're talking about. Well, let's understand what we're talking about. We're told in this chapter, because they're like this, the one who's coming is in accord with the activity of Satan in verse 9, with all power, signs, and wonders. Notice it. There it is again. And with all deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the knowledge of the truth so as to be saved. Saved in this context is not talking about Salvation in the terms of justification. It's talking about salvation in the terms of redemption. Lift up your head. Your redemption draws near. He who perseveres to the end shall be saved. Salvation is not only past. It is present and future. We were saved and we were born again. We were justified. We are being saved. We are being sanctified. We shall be saved. We shall be redeemed. There are people who are going to profess Christianity. But instead, they're going to go this way. They're going to follow this deception with all the deceptions of wickedness for those who perish because they did not love the truth. Jesus is the truth. If you don't love the truth, that is God's word, you don't love Jesus Christ. It's all religious blabbing. For this reason, God will send upon them a delusion to make them believe what is false. Understand this. The Antichrist and false prophet will be a judgment on a reprobate world and on an apostate church. You want false prophets? Oh, I got a false prophet for you. You want to follow another Christ? Boy, have I got one. He will be a judgment. Remember, God put a lying spirit into the mouth of King Ahab's prophets. Micaiah knew it. I'll make you believe a lie. You want to believe a lie? I'll make you believe that lie. This is a judgment. Apostasy in the church, God hands them over to it. We're told the same thing in Romans chapter 1, for instance, when people went on repentant homosexuality and lesbianism. God hands them over to it. They believe it's normal. He gives them over to it in judgment. By the grace of God, I got saved. When I was a teenager, I was addicted to cocaine. What happened? I got saved. God gives people over to these things. but it's going to be signs and wonders. How is God going to cause them to believe a lie? He's going to put on a show. Now, when people are flocking to see Benny and Kenny, to see the show, if you can't see through an obvious heretic, an obvious false prophet, people who demonstrably can be documented, have predicted things in God's name that haven't happened, if you can't see through obvious deceivers, what's going to happen when this guy shows up? Don't do calculus if you don't know how to count. <laughs> but let's look. It begins with the Nassim, Vanifla, or the signs and wonders. But there's something else Antichrist is going to use before you get the 666, and it is happening. There are many types of the Antichrist in Scripture. We're going to look at two of the most important tonight. The most important type of the Antichrist in the New Testament is without question. 
Yehuda Iskariot, known to you as Judas Iscariot. Judas and the Antichrist are the only two people called, not a son, definite article, the son of perdition. Second, they're both into this big time. Third, many people are demonically possessed. Only two people in Scripture are satanically possessed. That is, Satan comes inside of them. What does it say of Judas? And Satan entered him. The Antichrist, Satan. They're not demon-possessed. They are Satan-possessed. Fourth, the apostolic description. When John writes of Antichrist, he describes Antichrist in the character of Judas. They went out from among us, but they were not of us. This is Antichrist. He looks like one of us, just like Judas. But this guy was good. Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? He was so good, nobody knew who he was except Jesus, and nobody knew who he was until Jesus identified him to them. We are not going to know who this is until Jesus identifies it. You understand? This guy's going to be good. The Lord will identify him to the faithful who are here at that time. People won't know who it is until it's too late. There's much more we can say about him, much more than we could ever do tonight. But understand how Judas operated. How did he pull this off? Our ministry, our biggest ministry, well, Israel will be about equal with it, but otherwise our biggest ministry is our orphanages in Africa for AIDS babies and HIV children. It's important to care for the sick, to take care of the poor and children dying of AIDS in the third world. But you know, the biggest need of a poor person is the same as the biggest need of a rich person, salvation. It's not medication, it's not food, it's not shelter. Those things are necessary, but they're not the biggest need. The biggest need of a poor person is the same as the biggest need of a rich person, salvation. Social Gospels. One organization after another that began right has become corrupted with a purely social gospel, a human organization that simply tries to alleviate poverty. Salvation Army began right, Bernardo's began right, World Vision began right, but they all progressively have become purely social programs, no longer preaching repentance and regeneration. Look with me, please, at Judas. Whenever you see something about Judas, the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us something about the Antichrist. Turn with me to John chapter 12, please, verse 4 to 6. I've got a book coming out on this subject, and we have tapes. I don't know if there's any out there, but it takes five hours just to do the introduction. You're not even getting a nutshell version. You're getting a scratching of the surface and hardly that. But let's look at John chapter 12. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. As he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Notice the son of perdition plays the charity card, plays the humanitarian card. He tries to look like a wonderful humanitarian. Oh, the poor. Sort of like a Democrat or a liberal. Republicans are no better, but they just play that card to manipulate people into thinking that, <laughs> well, 
they're trying to create a permanent underclass of people who will not be upwardly mobile in order to keep themselves in power and in pocket. That's what liberals do. That's what they do in Britain. That's what they do in America. I'm not trying to speak politically, but that's the name of the game. They, <laughs> it's just a ticket. If you look at their personal lives and the way they live, that's not where they're at. They're the same as the Republicans. They're just playing a political card. He pretends to care about the poor because that's his way of getting his own pockets lined and keeping himself ingratiated with people. Now it's Judas. But let's look more closely. Look at Mark chapter 14, verse 4. Look at it synoptically. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, Why was this perfume wasted? The perfume might have been sold over 300 denarii, the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. Notice now it's not just Judas, it's some of them. He's at the epicenter of it. He's egging it on. It's his brainchild, but now it's not just him. But then it gets more popular. Look at Matthew's version, chapter 26, verses 8 and 9. But the disciples, now it's the majority apparently, but the disciples were indignant when they saw this and said, why this waste? This perfume might have been sold for a high price, money given to the poor. I don't know. If you don't love Jesus first, you don't love the poor. Their biggest need is Jesus. Now again, I say this as somebody who directs a ministry that takes care of people so poor you couldn't imagine it unless you've been to the third world. Nonetheless, notice what Judas does. He gets everybody jumping on this bandwagon about the poor, when the poor are just his way to con, deceive, manipulate, ingratiate. That is what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to represent himself or misrepresent himself as a wonderful, compassionate humanitarian. How dare you speak against such a compassionate man? He's going to make Albert Schweitzer look like Jack the Ripper. He's going to make Mother Teresa look like the Whore of Babylon. This guy is going to be good. Three months before she died, I happened to be in America at the time, although I lived in Israel, and I watched on PBS in America when Mother Teresa got the Nobel Prize. She had an exorcism, according to the Catholic Church in India, and she stated, and I'm only quoting her, she does not attempt to convert Hindus or Muslims to be Christians. She tries to convert them, she said, to be better Hindus and better Muslims. Waleed is coming. Ask Waleed how you make somebody a better Muslim. Give him a hand grenade? <laughs> Don't take it from me. Take it from a terrorist who got saved. How dare you say that about Mother Teresa? She's cleaning up the poor and sending them off to hell in a laundry chute without Christ. That was her God. How dare you say that? You speak against this one. You understand what happens? Jesus gets shelved a social gospel, a false humanitarian concern, masquerades where the guy's really at. It's about power and money. Again, I'm not trying to be political. What do you think Obama is or any politician? This is the same thing. Same thing. Same thing. Just uh, Jim Crow with a smile. Keep the black man down so we'll have a power base for ourselves. That's what they want to do. Keep them reliant on, on them getting reelected. That, that's what they did. It's just the same thing. Well, why is it like that? That's the spirit of Antichrist. It's setting the stage for what's coming. Only this guy's going to be good. <laughs> Forget about Obama Nation or whatever he is. This guy is going to be really good. Social gospel. A signs and wonders God. Now, can you imagine somebody who looks like a wonderful humanitarian who could put on a show? Only unlike Benny and Kenny, some of his miracles are going to be real. These two guys. And one will not just be political. One will be religious. It's being staged as we speak. 
the groundwork is being laid politically, culturally in popular culture with postmodernism, and it's being laid in the church. We can all work together. Understand this. What did Rick Warren say? He can work with Hindus. He can work with Muslims. He spoke at a synagogue in California, the Union of, of, of Reformed Synagogues here in California. Didn't preach the gospel to Jews. Can you imagine Paul the Apostle, the Peter the Apostle in a synagogue, not talking about Yeshua, Jesus being the Messiah? Christ gets put on the shelf. We have to work together, the brotherhood of man, to build a better world. You understand how it works? This is the spirit of Antichrist. They're being set up for it. Social gospel and a signs and wonders gospel. A convergence of the political, economic, and religious. So we have the political, we have the religious, but then it all comes down to money. 666. There's been so many speculations, much of it's silly. I understand what gematria is, but gematria, the numerical value of Hebrew and Greek letters, or mainly Hebrew letters, to find out the name was first applied to Nero, but it depended on using the Hebrew instead of Greek, and he had to misspell Nero to get it. He was the first one they ever did 666 with. Nonetheless, let's understand what the Bible says about 666. Before you worry about the Roman numeral equivalent of Henry Kissinger's name or whatever, and all this other stuff people have done, the first thing people should do, the first place they should look, is not at politicians or religious leaders or even gematria. The first place they should look, where else does that number occur in the Word of God and in what context? Where else does 666 occur in Scripture and in what context? It's in there a lot of times. And it always means something about the Antichrist. Why are people talking about politicians and all? First look at the Scripture. Then you'll be able to understand what's happening in the political and economic sphere. Remember Habakkuk? He took a stand on the watchtower. You stand on the Word of God to see what's coming. You can only look at the political sphere and the economic sphere and the religious sphere from the perspective of Scripture, illuminated by the Holy Spirit. Then you'll understand what's happening. But if you're just trying to go and look at what's coming, you're not standing on the watchtower. You're not going to see anything until it's too late. You need Doppler. You need over the horizon. You need the Word of God. Sometimes it comes in the gematria of 18, three sixes. Sometimes it's things like, obviously, the dimensions of Nebuchadnezzar's image, 666 in Aramaic. It's the word play in the book of Daniel. It comes out to 666. It's the weight and dimensions of Goliath's armor. His armor bearer goes before him as the Antichrist has the false prophet going before him. What is the weight and dimensions of Goliath's armor work out to? Mathematically, 666. It's all over the place. But every time you see it, it's something about this. If you don't understand all the other 666s in the Bible, you won't understand the ultimate one in Revelation. We're looking in the wrong place. You want to do calculus? Learn algebra. You want to do algebra? Learn arithmetic. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. Let's look. The number of the beast. It occurs in Ezra with the sons of Adoniah come and in Nehemiah coming back from the Babylonian captivity. That means something. But with no individual does that number occur more than with backslidden Solomon. We got a problem with Solomon. Because in the Song of Solomon, he's a type of Christ. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus used him as a type of Christ. But when he backslides, it's a type of the Antichrist. I don't know if they're right, but Satanists and Freemasons claim him as one of their originators. That's their claim. You have Solomon's quarries in Jerusalem to this day. The Masons go there. But let's look at this. Turn with me, please, to Second Chronicles chapter 9. 
You won't get this stuff in commentaries because they're written by people with Hellenistic minds. Second Chronicles chapter 9, verse 11. Jesus uses the queen of Sheba, Marki Sheba, as a type of the Gentile church, doesn't he? He says, the queen of Sheba came to hear the wisdom of Solomon, but someone greater than Solomon is here. Now look at this. Second Chronicles chapter 9, verse 12. We'll look at verse 12. Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, gave to the queen of Sheba all her desire which she requested, in addition, a return for what she had bought to the king. Then she turned and went to her own land with her servants. Now the weight of gold which came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. The Gentile woman goes away with their servants, and this guy is revealed with 666, something to do with wealth. Financial control, obviously. But he impresses her with his wisdom. It says in the book of Daniel, the Antichrist will know hetaim, the words of the wise in their riddles. Solomon wrote Proverbs 1. What does it say in the book of Proverbs chapter 1? To know a proverb and a riddle, the words of the wise and their riddles. The Antichrist will have a kind of insight into Scripture. Satan is a defeated enemy, but he is not a defunct one. He's a lot smarter than we are. Much smarter. Much stronger. The only thing we have is Jesus. Let's look. 666, besides that which the traders and merchants bought, this guy's in business, just like Revelation 13. And all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the country bought gold, silver to Solomon, and Solomon made 200 large shields of beaten gold using 600 shekels of beaten gold on each shield of the 666. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold using 300 shekels of gold in each shield, and the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with pure gold, and there were... Six steps to the throne, and a footstool in gold attached to the throne, and the arms on each side of the seat, and two lions standing next to the arms. Twelve lions were standing there on the six steps, on the one side and on the other side. Nothing like it was made for any other kingdom. Six lions, six steps, six lions, six, six, six. Now notice in the divine architecture in Revelation, prefigured by the uh, ancient Persian court in the book of Ezra from a literary perspective. In God's architecture, everything's a seven or combinations of seven. In God's design, it's seven. Why here is it all sixes? Three sets of sixes. Now let's look again. His drinking vessels were of gold. The vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Silver was not considered valuable in the days of Solomon. This is an issue. For iron, I'll give you silver. For brass, I'll give you gold. Iron is judgment. Silver is the price of redemption. In the book of Leviticus, half shekel for the firstborn. The firstborn is a type, an Old Testament shadow of Jesus. Jesus was betrayed for silver. Silver has to do with salvation. Silver is a corrosive metal. God has silver, but it's corrosive. It's of temporary value. In the book of Revelation, once the redemption is complete, you don't see silver anymore. You understand? It's of temporary value. In other words, we were created to be God's children. We were not created to be saved. We'll always be grateful for our salvation. God foreknew we would fall and need to be saved, but as it were, salvation is parenthetical. We were not created to be saved. We were created to be God's children. Silver is of temporary value. It's a corrosive metal. God is a non-corrosive metal. Uh, gold is a non-corrosive metal. It, won't ex it will not oxidize. The Antichrist wants this stuff for good. He doesn't want salvation. Now, this is typology. I'm not 
trying to base doctrine on type. We use the typology to illustrate doctrine, but you'd have to go into the typology of precious metals beginning in Genesis. That's what this stuff means. You'd have to follow this typology through Leviticus. But let's continue. Where's this gold come from? The king had ships which went to Tarshish with the servants of Hodom. Once every three years, the ships of Tarshish came bringing the gold. Tarshish. When the Holy Spirit inspires more than one account of something, to be in the Bible, it's important. The more times God puts something in Scripture, the more important it is. Everything in the Bible is important. It's God's Word. There's nothing in Scripture not important. But some things are more important than others. It's all important, but some more important than others. How do you know? Well, Jesus said this. He spoke of straining a gnat and swallowing a camel. He spoke of the weightier matters of the law. It's all important, but some things are more important than others. The more times the Holy Spirit puts something in the Bible, the more important it is. We've got four Gospels, John and the Synoptics. Well, so you have the biographical account of Kings, the historical account of Chronicles, and whatever prophet or prophets prophesied during that time frame. When you read a book of a prophet, always read the first verse of the first chapter. That's called the superscription. The word of the Lord came to Amos during the reign of this king, this king, this king. Then you go to Kings and Chronicles and see what happened. You have multiple accounts in the Old Testament, the same as you do in the New. The more times the Holy Spirit puts something in the Bible, the more important it is. If it's reiterated, it's more important. It's all important, but the more times God puts it in there, the more important it is. And 666 is in there plenty of times. But let's look. Turn with me, please, to 1 Kings chapter 10. Let's begin in verse 13. Solomon gave to Queen of Sheba all the desire which she requested in addition to what he gave her according to his royal bounty. She turns and goes away to her own land together with her servants. Someone who Jesus uses as a figure of the Gentile church leads with her servants when this guy is identified with 666. Now the weight of gold which came to Solomon in one year was... 666 talents of... There it is again! Why does 666 keep showing up with Solomon? In addition to that, from the traders and the wares and the merchants, he's in business, he's controlling the economy. Just like Revelation. Why don't they put that in commentaries? That's what happens when you take a Jewish faith called Christianity and turn it into a Hellenistic one. But let's continue. King Solomon made 200 large shields from beaten gold using 600 shekels of gold in each shield. He made 300 shields of beaten gold using three minas of gold in each shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, a king made a great throne of ivory, overlaid it with refined gold. There were six steps to the throne... And around top of the throne, on the back of it, and arms on each side of the seat, two lions standing next to the arms. Twelve lions were standing on one on the six steps, on the one side and on the other. Six, then the six steps, then the six lions, six, six, six. Why does six, six, six keep showing up with this guy? Man, where does he get this gold? Where does he get it? Verse 22, the king had at sea the ships of Tarshish. What is this thing with Tarshish? Tarshish. God doesn't seem to like Tarshish. Isaiah warns about Tarshish. Somebody named Tarshish in Esther, but it was from the table of nations in Genesis 10 is where it begins. What is this Tarshish with the gold, with the 666? The 666 comes from Tarshish. Three possible Tarshishes. One is somewhere on the coast of East Africa, around Somalia today, where the Queen of Sheba likely came from. Another was believed to be near the Rock of Gibraltar, the farthest end of the Mediterranean in the days of Jonah. The third, by some traditions, it was an ancient name of Great Britain, a Celtic, early Celtic name of Britain. May have been the same... Nation, from Genesis 10 after the flood, 
found their way to these places. That may be the common link. I don't know. Anthropologists don't know. But there's something about Tarshish that God doesn't like. Turn with me, please, to the book of Jonah, chapter 1. That's where the 666 comes from, Tarshish. Verse 3, but Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. (laughs) He gets on a ship to Jaffa near Tel Aviv, goes to Tarshish. That was the end of the known world. That was the opposite diametric, 180 degree, opposite side of the Mediterranean. Southern Spain, somewhere near the Rock of Gibraltar. Far as he could get. The easternmost outpost of known civilization then, right on the edge, going towards the edge of the desert of Belushistan, which even Alexander the Great couldn't cross, was Nineveh. So you have Nineveh on the extreme east, Tarshish on the extreme west. Jonah tried to go as far as he possibly could from where God wanted him to be. (laughs) He gets on that ship to Tarshish, and God causes the ship to sink, to prevent him from going to Tarshish. He was out of God's will. Look with me, please, to the book of Psalms, chapter 48, verse 7. With the east wind, the Heraklio, the Heraklio, the east wind in Greek, Heraklio in Greek, sorry, the east wind, that is what destroyed the ship of Paul in Acts 27. Thou dost break the ships of Tarshish. God's got a problem with Tarshish. That's where the 666 talents of gold comes from. There's something about it. But we've got to figure out what it is, only we're not smart enough. Fortunately, we have a very good teacher. It's not Jacob Prash. Jesus said, one is your teacher who's in heaven. That's the name of our ministry, Moriel. God is my teacher, Moriel. The Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. We have a good teacher because we're just not clever enough to figure this out. It's well beyond us. Now notice something. You don't hear much of this stuff anymore, do you? When I was first saved in the early 1970s, everybody was talking about the return of Jesus. The books were rather silly, some of them, oversimplifications of eschatology. But at least people were interested in the return of Christ You couldn't print enough copies of late great planet Earth or whatever. Now, we're nearly 40 years closer to his return than when I was first saved. And as I just told people at the conference I did with Chuck Smith and David Hawking, you go to a bookshop today, you don't find late great planet Earth. You find seven steps to prosperity, five keys to victories, (laughs) psychology, psychobabble, con artistry. We're 40 years closer to the return of Christ, and there's much less interest in it now than there was 40 years ago. At a time we should be getting deeper into the Scriptures, people are getting further away from it. Well, let's understand this. Something about this Tarshish. Look with me, please, to Second Chronicles chapter 20. You got a great king, a man who bought revival. Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, Jehovah shall judge, or Jehovah is judge. Good guy. But he had a big problem. He had this one weakness in his life, even though he was one of the best kings ever. We did a tape on it called Chink in the Armor. What was his problem? Nepotism. He allowed family allegiances to supersede the consideration she should have given. Blood is thicker than water by God's design. With good motives, he tended to make alliances with bad people. Beginning with King Ahab. 
King Ahab was married to Jezebel, who Jesus uses as a metaphor for false religion, spiritual seduction. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. He rode in his chariot. Every time I see a decent preacher going on TBN or the Godless Channel, I want to vomit. What happened when he rode in Ahab's chariot? He became mistaken with Ahab and made himself a target. They see good men on those TV stations. They think you're one of those con artist money preachers. In my opinion, there's enough good churches, enough people, and enough money in Calvary Chapel to make its own Christian TV. It doesn't need to be involved with those people. You make yourself a target if you ride in Ahab's chariot, they think you're Ahab. God saves his neck the first time, but then he gets into it again. Eventually, he causes them to get knocked off. His motives were not wrong. Oh, come on, we're all Jews. Yeah, but you're backslidden. <laughs> We're all Hebrews. We have the same God. We have a common enemy. We have to work together. Don't you want to see the throne of David restored? He was a sucker for that. But there were family ties through marriage. One of the things I respect about Pastor Chuck Smith is this, and I please don't. <laughs> Whenever it came down to heresy, he always took a stand. He booted out Wimber, he booted out Lonnie Frisbee, and even when it came down to members of his own family, he did the right thing. There's not many pastors who would do that. That's why God has blessed Calvary Chapel in part. That's one reason. There's a lot of other churches that they wouldn't do. They would put the family loyalty first before the word. Now, Chuck didn't do that. But there's a high price to do that. He's fairly rare. Maybe I wouldn't say unique, but he's fairly rare. And a lot of other people... <laughs> They turned the church into the family business. They got members of the, of the family on the board. So if you disagree with the board, you've gone against the family. It's I've seen two Jewish mission organizations destroyed because it became a family enterprise and the people in the mission field that were, had cousins and uncles on the board. And if you went against it, you were like going against the family. It was <laughs> no objective consideration. Bad thing. And family is something, and family loyalty is something that God designed for good. But anything God designs for good, the world will use for evil. Doesn't matter if it's sexuality, doesn't matter if it's family, doesn't matter if it's human government. Anything God intends for good, the world, the flesh, and the devil will try to corrupt and use for evil. And so we have a situation here, a good king who had this weakness for getting involved with these bad cousins of his up north. Well, Ahab dies under the judgment of God and his son comes to power. He's not only the son of Ahab, who else son is he? He's the son of Jezebel. And he falls for it again. Look with me, please, to Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 31. Now, Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah. He was 35 years old. He became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 25 years. His mother's name was Azuvah, the daughter of Shidhi. And he walked in the way of his father Asa, another good king, and did not depart from it, doing right in the sight of the Lord. The high places, however, were not removed. The people had not yet directed their hearts to the God of their fathers. Notice something. A good king can stop things from going completely off. A good leader can stop things from going completely off. But even the best leader cannot turn people's hearts. <laughs> People get the leaders they deserve. Nations get the leaders they deserve. Churches get the leaders they deserve. Why do you think we have scum in the Congress and the White House? Because it's a backslidden nation that's turned away from its Judeo-Christian biblical heritage. Jesus called the church to be salt and light. We have scum in the White House because we have scum in the pulpit. Turn on the idiot box and watch the con artists pervert the gospel. Discredit the message of Jesus in the eyes of the world. The people had not turned their hearts. The king had a right heart. The king could stop things from going off, but he couldn't make things what they should. A leader can set an example, and he can stop things from going completely off, but that's all he can do. 
And I've got a concern. Because of the way he operates and because of the way he's always operated, as long as Chuck Smith is still with us, and may God prolong his days, and I'm not saying this to glorify Chuck, I'm just saying it's a fact. As long as Chuck Smith is here, Calvary chapels as a movement are not going to go off the way so many other churches and denominations have as long as he's here. But what happens when he isn't? You understand? The book of Kings, the book of Chronicles, one generation could change everything. Same with the church, same with the denomination. Now look what it says. The rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, the first to the last, behold, are written in the annals of Jehu, the son of Hanani, which is recorded in the book of the kings of Israel. After this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, there he does it again, allies himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, that is the son of Jezebel. He acted wickedly in so doing. It wasn't the first time. God warned him in the past. God saved his neck in the past. God told him, don't do this. God warned him, keep away from this. But he does it again. So he allied himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. <laughs> and they made the ships in Etzion Geber. That's near, you know, Eilat is, the Israeli resort city of Eilat. On the Dead Sea, opposite Aquaba in Jordan. Then Eliezer, the son of Dodavahu and Marasha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you've allied yourself with Ahaziah, the Lord's destroyed your works. So the ships were broken, could not go to Tarshish. Just like Jonah, just like Psalms. God does not like his people going to Tarshish. But that's where the gold is! <laughs> I can understand his motives in wanting to see the glories they knew under David and Solomon restored, but that will only be restored in the millennial reign of Christ. Israel will be that when Jesus reigns from the throne of David in the millennium. I appreciate his motives, but he bought the bill of goods. Let's work together. First Kings 22, please. It's in there more than once. It's important. Very important. Let's look First Kings 22. Verse 41, Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, became king over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old. He became king, reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azuvah, the daughter of Shidhi, and he walked in the way of Asa, his father. He did not turn aside from doing right in the sight of the Lord. However, the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Notice something. The Hebrew word for idolatry, or the Hebrew idiom for idolatry, is the same as the Hebrew idiom for false religion, and it's the same term for unbiblical religion. Avodah Zerah. Worship, which is alien to Scripture, is Avodah Zerah. But it's also the Hebrew idiom for idolatry. In other words, if you have unbiblical worship today, you will end in idolatry tomorrow. They were not worshiping other gods in those high places. They were worshiping Yahweh. There is no doxology without theology, I once heard someone say in Britain, and he was right. Jesus said the Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. If the worship is not biblical, God does not accept it as worship. Today we have a big problem. Our faith is Christocentric, not pneumocentric. The Holy Spirit always points people to the Lord Jesus, never himself. What have you got today? Come, Holy Spirit, let your fire fall. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we worship you. None of that is biblical. The Holy Spirit is God and he's worshipped as God in the context of the Trinity only. Holy, holy, holy God in three persons, no problem, that is scriptural. 
But Holy Spirit, let your fire fall. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit. He does not operate that way. Not one time, not one place is the Holy Spirit ever addressed in prayer outside of the Trinity. He always points people to Christ. On biblical worship. So many of the things sung in the, in the Vineyard Hymn Book, the words are not even biblical. People think it's worship. No, what we have today is the worship of worship, entertainment. What used to be the Christian music ministry has become a Christian music industry based in Nashville, Tennessee. Some of them even have groupies. They've got music publishing companies, hit parades, pop charts. Same as the world. It's an industry. In fact, most secular recording companies are today owned. Most Christian recording companies are today owned by secular conglomerates. Same as the publishing industry. Used to be a publishing ministry. We've got a big problem. The worship of worship, it is entertainment. Believe me, the world is always going to do it better. We are called to bring the gospel into the world, not to bring the world into the gospel. Unbiblical worship is avodah zerah. There was one high place and one high place only where God ordained to be worshipped. Gadol Adunayu meulal meod beir Eloheinu har kodesho yefenov sos ben kol haaretz haretzi on. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised, the city of our God, the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for elevation, high place. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. They were worshiping Yahweh on Canaanite high places. Before long, they were worshiping a different God on those high places. Once you worship the true God in the wrong way, You've got Rick Warren on television, not praying to Yeshua HaMessiah, but praying to Isa. You've got people from Biola saying that we can have a rapprochement with the Mormons, even though they're Jesus as the spirit brother of Satan. People saying that Allah, the Nabataean moon god, is the god of Christians and Jews. That the Eucharist, the transubstantiated elements, as it's claimed, is the Jesus of the gospel. No. It's idolatry. The stage is being set, but the worst is yet to come. Fortunately, so is the best yet to come. But Antichrist comes, and the stage is being prepared for him. Look what happens. This guy is there, and he's doing his bit. First Kings 22, let's look again. Verse 44, Jehoshaphat also made peace with the king of Israel. He should be making not peace with the king of Israel. Oh, we have the same God. We're all Hebrews. Don't you believe in unity? You're divisive. Unity is unity of the spirit. But Jesus prayed we would be one in the high priestly prayer in John 17. Father, let them be one. Yeah, but he prefaced the prayer by saying, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Unity of the spirit depends on the truth. You cannot be one with people, united with people who don't have the truth. Unity of the spirit depends on truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He's not the spirit of error. That's the spirit of Antichrist. You get in bed with the Pope, he's in bed with the Dalai Lama. Let's look. Now, the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, verse 45, and his might, which he showed, and how he warred. Are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And the remnant of the Sodomites who remained in the days of his father, he expelled from the land. He did not believe in same-sex marriage. He did not believe in homosexual ordination. Remember, two months ago, two months ago, and I'm only stating a fact, I'm not reading lives, two months ago, before God knows how many tens of millions of people, and I'm only stating a fact, Rick Warren appeared on Larry King Live, and he apologized on your behalf. He apologized on behalf of the born-again Christians of the state of California to the quote-unquote gay and lesbian community for the support of Proposition 8. He apologized. 
on your behalf because you opposed homosexuals getting married and being able to adopt children and bring them up to be homosexuals. But don't worry, he, he apologized for you. If you're against that, don't worry. He already told the gay and lesbian community that you were sorry. At least he was. <laughs> Stating a fact. Oh, you're critical! No, if you believe that's right, you're nuts. <laughs> this guy did a lot of good stuff. Spelled the side of my... Now, no, don't get me wrong. I was a cocaine addict. Their sin is no worse than mine. I know plenty of homosexuals and lesbians that the Lord saved them. And they're wonderful people, wonderful brethren. And their sin was no worse than mine. My cocaine addiction could have killed me. It killed some of my friends. That lifestyle will kill them. They need to get saved. There was no king in Edom. A deputy was king. Watch out when there's a gap in leadership. I saw this happened in England. Martin Lloyd-Jones went to be with the Lord. F.F. F. Bruce went to be with the Lord. There was no more leaders in Great Britain, only theocrats. I got a concern now. Dave Hunt is 82. Chuck Smith, 82. Dave Wilkerson, 80. Tim LaHaye, 87. What's going to happen when we don't have these brothers around anymore? Sooner or later, they're going to have to retire or they're going to go be with the Lord. Where's the next generation going to step up to the plate? I don't see too many shepherds. I just see a lot of hirelings. I don't see too many prophets. I just see a lot of false ones. I don't see too many teachers. I just see a lot of hype artists and heretics. What is going to happen when we don't have these people anymore at the helm? Who is going to step up to the plate? I saw this happen in Britain where I live, and I'm seeing the same scenario beginning to come into play in America. Because they're making deals with the king of Israel. They're going on television with people they shouldn't be on television with. I've got a TV show in England, but I will not even be on the same channel, the same station with Benny, Kenny, and Joyce. I don't want to be identified with them. I don't want to ride at Ahab's chariot. Jehoshaphat made ships of Tarshish. Where'd that 666 come from? Tarshish. To go to Ophir for gold. But they did not go, for the ships were broken at Etzion Geber. Then Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, Let my servants go with your servants in the ships. But Jehoshaphat wasn't willing. Well, we don't want to go all the way with this thing. We don't agree with the entire purpose-driven lie, just the true bits of it. Well, I know the, the shack is a piece of garbage, but the first chapter is nice. It's the king of Israel. It's the son of Jezebel. So is this. Somebody had the audacity to give me this as a present. <laughs> Your best life now. Every deception. <laughs> it was a joke. Every deception of Satan aimed at the body of Christ today in the Western world is to hoodwink us into trusting in this life. The word faith, name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. Post-millennialism, kingdom now, dominion theology, the purpose-driven lie. What's it all about? Trusting in this world. We're supposed to trust in the world that's coming. Just be salt and light in this one. No, make an alliance with the king of Israel. He's your brother. Don't treat his age, your brother. If the word of God says it's wrong, it's wrong. It's not my judgment.
Let's go to Tarshish together. We can work with them. No, I can't work with them. They get on a ship to Tarshish. The Lord does not want me to go there. That's where 666 comes from. I don't want to be aligned with people like that because Jesus doesn't want me to. If we're lucky, the ship will sink. If we're lucky, the Lord will wreck the ship like he did in Jonah, like he did in Psalm 48, like he did here in Kings and Chronicles. If we're lucky, in his mercy, the God will cause the ship to sink. God forbid it should arrive there with us traveling on it. You understand what's happening? There's three kinds of people in God's economy. Jews, Gentiles, and believers who can be either Jews or Gentiles. God has got Israel, by and large, deceived. My son's a lawyer in the Israeli army. That nation is unbelieving, although the number of Jews who believe in Israel is growing. I've got to sigh the son in the Israeli military. The nations? Satan's got them in his pocket. That leaves the church. But there's the church and there's the church. There's the bride and the apostate church. There's Israel and Judah. How can a Christian, a pastor, remain part of a denomination that will ordain homosexuals? How can you get in bed with the king of Israel? Oh, he'll give you the religious line. We have the same God. We're brothers. We have to be united. He's sailing to Tarshish. The Holy Spirit is preparing us for the coming of Christ. The spirit of Antichrist is preparing the world for the coming of Antichrist. He's going to make a treaty with the Jews and suck them in. He's going to make a treaty with the nations and suck them in. He's already got them. He's trying to get to us. And he's doing it. As we speak, Revelation 13, the signs and wonders movement. That's not to denounce signs and wonders understood and practiced biblically. It's just most of what you see is not biblical. And it's getting worse. The social gospel, Rick Warren's peace plan. That's different than God's peace plan. But ultimately, it'll be economic, won't it? Globalization of the world economy, more and more centralization by government. These things are being set up even politically and economically. But we can't stop the world. The church should know better. But it doesn't. They bought a ticket for a cruise to Tarshish. We know what comes from Tarshish. That is where the backslidden church is sailing to. That is where the apostate church is sailing to. That is where the ecumenical church is sailing to. That is where the purpose-driven church is sailing to. Tarshish. What comes from Tarshish? Six, six, six. They're sailing to Tarshish. My prayer for myself and my family. My prayer for you and your family. My prayer for my church in England. My prayer for this church here in San Jacinto is this prayer. They may be sailing to Tarshish, but please, Jesus, let the ship sink and don't let us get on it. God bless. We have a book and tape table with some recorded material. I want to thank Pastor Hughes and Bob for inviting me. Believe it or not, some churches wouldn't invite me. For some reason, they consider me to be too controversial.